Hello everyone and welcome to Reader Day Club. This is Amreen. Good morning actually because it is now 7 o'clock. So I have quite a busy day ahead of me. I've got a bunch of things to do. But the most important of them all is starting a new book, Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter by Simone de Beauvoir, my very first de Beauvoir. Now, I, I, I've decided to go into this book blind, completely blind, meaning I have not read any essays, I've not watched, I mean, I've not read any reviews, articles, I've not watched any videos about the book, and I haven't started the book yet, but I'm going to do that later in the evening. All right, so I am 50 pages in and let's spill those beans. Okay, so uh, Simone de Beauvoir, French writer and philosopher who decided to write this book to talk about her childhood and early adult life. So obviously the work's non-fiction and just totally, completely fantastic. So the first 50 pages are all about uh, Simone de Beauvoir talking about her family life, her mother, her father, her younger sister, their social status, religious, um, religious beliefs. And uh, her mother was a devout Catholic. And so that level of faith in God rubbed off on Simone de Beauvoir as well. So as a child, she always believed that whatever her parents did for her was the will of God. Because it was God, after all, who had created her and had died for her. So he was entitled to her total submission. And her relationship with her father also seems like a healthy one so far. And uh, she talks about her father giving more attention to her education as she grew up and about how she how she never felt uneasy around him because he was never intimidating or condescending. But at such an early age, she realized their shortcomings. Although that never reduced the intensity uh, of the love and affection that she felt towards them. And at such an early age, even before she was uh, five or six years old, I think, she she realized that there were things that were not true but were accepted as the truth and she found it very surprising that adults you know that adults chose to live this way that she too had to there's something about that that I remember reading where is that yeah okay so she says that white was only rarely totally white and the blackness of evil was relieved by lighter touches. She saw greys and half tones everywhere. So uh, it's, you know, it's sort of unbelievable how a child can have such profound thoughts. And just this part in the book, I found so fascinating to read because I mean, how can someone so, so young have such, um, think about such serious concepts like culture, custom, manner, you know, and all these human things not being associated with religion. So you sort of create a, a barrier between God and life and the world. I mean, how can, uh, how can a child even begin to understand that real living, that reality is so much more rewarding than all the illusions that our imagination gives rise to? So she's aware of her beginning. She's aware of a beginning, her consciousness and awareness. I had at least emerged from the shades, but the things all around me remained lost in darkness. I enjoyed those tales in which needles were given ideas proper to needle, needles, and the sideboard was provided with thoughts that were essentially those of a wooden sideboard. But they were, after all, just stories. Objects had black impenetrable hearts and reposed upon the earth without being remotely aware that they were doing so and without being able to murmur reassuringly here i am i have related elsewhere i have related elsewhere how at merignac i stupidly gazed at an old jacket thrown over the back of the chair i tried to put myself as it were inside the jacket and say i am a tired old jacket it was quite impossible and I was stricken with panic. 
in the darkness of the past, in the stillness of inanimate beings, I had dire forebodings of my own extinction. I conjured up delusive fallacies and turned them into omens of the truth and of my own death. It was through my own eyes that light was created. So uh, after this, she talks about, obviously, she talks about her growing thirst for and love of knowledge and at the age of six. Can you believe it? So, um, you know, actually her father was an avid reader and they came from a very uh, elite and privileged social class. Although she does mention uh, that her upbringing was such that it sort of conditioned her into finding things like virtue and culture more desirable than material wealth and about knowledge and literature she always felt the need to was that part yeah to pass on the knowledge she had acquired so she says that she, since she had started working seriously time no longer fled away but left its mark on her by sharing her knowledge with another she was fixing time on another's memory and so making it doubly secure you know, here she says something about about books that I found very relatable here. If I took so much pleasure in study, it was perhaps because my daily life no longer satisfied me. The scanty resources of my city childhood could not compete with the riches to be found in books. All right, so that's a pretty long rant after reading just 50 pages. I have over over 300 pages to cover practically the whole book. So um, I wonder how long this video is going to be. But uh, that's philosophy. That is distinguished intellectuals like Simone de Beauvoir. What are you going to do? Welcome back. So I am 160 pages through. I was actually supposed to stop at 120, but then I kept going and going and I was like, okay, now I'll stop. Okay, no, now I'll stop. But then that stop had to be forced. It did not come naturally. And um, you know, this book is so hard to put down. Like I still, I still want to read more, but then I also want to share my thoughts here and then continue reading. All right, so I have obviously covered quite a lot in this much and I still have so much to go, right? So where do I begin from? Okay, so now she is growing up and realizing this world, this whole universe of things. Um, you know, she keeps telling herself that she's not just anyone, that she doesn't want to be just anyone about how she wants to be in charge of her own life despite being a girl. So her mother starts taking her to libraries and uh, bookstores where, uh, but she's only allowed to read works suitable for children. Nevertheless, she is ecstatic. I mean, who wouldn't be? Uh, where's that part? I think I remember something from that part. Okay, so she says that um, I stood with arms akimbo in front of the section marked works suitable for children in which there were hundreds of volumes. All this belongs to me, I said to myself. 
Bewildered by such a profusion of riches, the reality surpassed my wildest dreams. Before me lay the entry to a rich and unknown paradise. So now you know why I decided to shoot this part of the um, of my video in front of my books because you, you know sometimes even I look at them and you know I have this childlike amazement where I wonder that you know that all this belongs to me. So uh, anyway where was i uh, all right so her love for literature from there on just keeps growing bigger and bigger when she reads alcott's little women she immediately identifies herself with uh, the character joe she's the uh, the intellectual one the one who reads books she also resonates with joe because she feels that joe is superior to all her sisters and she also feels that just like joe even her life is going to be unique right and then she makes a friend at school uh, her name's elizabeth they call her zaza whom she admires profoundly simply because zaza's resplendent independence of spirit completely leaves her feeling astounded now you should know that simone de beauvoir's childhood even um, since she was a girl was very conventional and prejudiced right so i remember reading a part where her mother uh, flattens simone de beauvoir's breasts which had obviously started to grow and show since she was not a child anymore so she flattens her breasts using bandages and uh, so it did not take long for simone de beauvoir to then you know associate her lady parts with a sort of deformity or disability that had to be tucked away so to have another girl from another family being brought up in such an uh, unusual manner you know it uh, it was a bit shocking to her and it sort of made her question uh, the whole validity of tradition and truth and then we have um, you know these episodes mingling with her transformation from girlhood into uh, into womanhood so she has these nightmares uh, where someone unknown seems to be suffocating the life out of her and these nightmares were a reflection of just how suffocated she felt in her real life because of the inflexible and authoritarian type of environment she grew up in she says that her mother had her own ideas and beliefs that she didn't even care enough to justify so in a way she loses her sense of security that she felt during her childhood years because she considered her parents to be absolutely infallible and uh, this actually reminded me of a, a video i watched on youtube where jordan peterson talks about uh, the symbolic death of one's parents and how that can lead to the realization of your own individuality a scary and painful experience yes yet i don't know it can be cathartic as well right so uh, now she starts to read unsuitable items um, censored books in secret of course which books are those i can never find my excerpts quickly right so i can't pronounce the names most of the names of these authors so i'm just going to so through these uh, authors and works she learns about the act of love she gets her sex education in a way but you know right on the next page she also says that not one of these novels evoked an image of human love or of my own destiny which afforded me the slightest satisfaction i did not look to them for a foretaste of my own future but they gave me what i wanted they took me out of myself thanks to them i broke free from the bonds of childhood and entered a complicated adventurous and unpredictable world okay now circling back to her close and only friend zaza now every time she compares herself to her she gets into these episodes of deep deep contemplation which are so bloody fascinating i mean that is philosophy that stuff is you know it's going to hit you in the face i mean but you know it's 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 not like a blow it feels more like a warm much needed hug like uh, 
<laughs> like someone's hugging you in the face if that makes any sense all right so let me read one of those contemplations for you my curiosity embraced everything i believed in an absolute truth in the need for moral law my thoughts adapted themselves to their objects if occasionally one of them took me by surprise it was because it reflected something that was surprising i preferred good to evil and despite that which should be despised i could find no trace of my own subjectivity i had wanted myself to be boundless and i had become as shapeless as the infinite the paradox was that i became aware of this deficiency at the very moment when i discovered my individuality my universal aspiration had seemed to me until then to exist in its own right but now it had become a character trait simon is interested in everything i found myself limited by my refusal to be limited ideas and modes of conduct which had imposed themselves quite naturally upon me were in fact the reflections of my passivity and my lack of discrimination instead of being a pure mindset like a flawless jewel at the center of everything i took on flesh it was a painful fall from grace So now I'm just going to sum it up as in sum up what I have read so far. So uh Simone de Beauvoir talks about many things, World War 1, she also talks about social class, more like workers hating the bourgeoisie because they're aware of their own inferiority and um the uh, and she talks a little bit about communism as well and then you know she enters this stage of her life where um certain events lead her to sort of renounce her faith in uh, in renounce her faith in religion and that is a very monumental change in her life uh, for which she feels extremely guilty even she says that uh religious facts uh, i remember this uh, religious facts are only convincing to those who are already convinced here yeah, listen to this one i think i think it's somewhere here i no longer believed in god i told myself with no great surprise that was proof if i had believed in him i should not have allowed myself to offend him so lightheartedly i had always thought that the world was a small price to pay for eternity but it was worth more than that because i loved the world and it was suddenly god whose price was small from now on his name would have to be a cover for nothing more than a mirage it was uh, i was not denying him in order to rid myself of a troublesome person on the contrary i uh, on the contrary i realized he was playing no further part in my life and so i concluded that he had ceased to exist for me so in order to fill this uh this void that was once occupied by uh, religion uh, by god hopes in heaven faith and stuff like that she starts to look within deep deep within focusing more on worldly ambitions on recreating herself and you know just justifying her existence through writing through philosophy and leaving that legacy behind for us all which is exactly what she did and yeah one more thing i just have to mention because it seems to me to be an important structural theme so far what nature represented in her uh, in her life of solitude during her formative years right so she draws this uh, line of stark difference between her small limited experience of city life then there's the countryside you know the whole vastness of uh, of nature she refers to nature as a host of visible tangible modes of existence i mean she's fascinated by the uh, simplest things like um, i remember the isolation of trees the um, the innocence of morning sunrise the friendly scent of the honeysuckle so uh, nature seemed to bring about this boundless freedom of spirit into her life and that sort of encouraged uh, encouraged that desire she felt for independence
all right so i am done with the book uh, the last time i recorded was after i finished 160 pages and now i read the remaining bit which is over 200 pages or so and now within these she talks about uh, f um, so many things so her life is moving forward where she says that her future is not just an impossible dream anymore but you know that she can actually uh, that she can touch it and build up her life with her own hands so she's pursuing higher education and plans on training to become a professor i'm sorry for that sound in the background there's some construction work happening around my house so uh, anyway so yeah she is pursuing higher education and plans on uh, training to become a professor against her parents wishes because you know at the time it was not so ladylike uh, for for women to have ambitions like these so her mother actually starts to pray for her salvation and her father becomes completely indifferent towards her and even hostile so and and that leaves a very uh, dark heavy shadow on her uh, throughout her youth and she's mentioned this time and again in the hurly burly accompanying the end of the summer term I was bitterly conscious of the emptiness in my heart. I went on longing passionately for that something else which I couldn't put a name to because I refused to give it the only name I knew for it, happiness. Another recurring contemplation that Simone de Beauvoir indulges is, uh, you know, she always talks about how much she wants to think, to understand, to criticize and to know herself. So. You know, she drowns herself in her studies, books, uh, in literature, because she finds absolution in them, which is, uh, which is what religion did for her back when she believed in, uh, in God. And plenty of times she also talks about her own natural superiority to others, which is something I did not get. Although, you know, I don't think Simone de Beauvoir felt superior in uh, in a, in a condescending, grandiose or egotistical way, that superiority to me felt more like, you know, having the courage and even means, of course, to trample conformity. Because her friend Zaza certainly wasn't doing that. I mean, she was giving in to her mother's irrational, biased beliefs and uh, demands because she thought that as a devout Catholic she uh, and also as a woman was supposed to do that so uh, anyway Simone Simone de Beauvoir along the way makes a lot of friends both male and female some she likes and highly admires and some she doesn't regardless I mean irrespective of that she meets them she talks to them she goes to movies plays cafes with them and she she accepts all those disagreements and indifferences between her and them sort of uh, with an open mind and in between uh, she also has this rebellious um, almost juvenile phase uh, but then she gets over it as did we all at some point in our lives and um, so yeah I mean the rest of it is all about Simone de Beauvoir meeting new people studying and uh, falling in love well she thinks she's falling in love her idea of of love is also very refreshing and thought-provoking her idea of romantic love sexual morality it's all very interesting to read about and the very few men that she developed uh, developed um, that she developed a very genuine fondness for uh, you know they all seem to have something that she did not and um, about one she says where is that hmm. it was to him I owed pains and pleasures whose violence alone saved me from the deserts of boredom in which I found myself bogged down. So um, after this, of course, she talks about her friendship with Jean-Paul Sartre and their friendship blossoms into something wonderful for Simone de Beauvoir. About him as well, she writes, and you know, she's actually described how he was before he became this prominent figure of uh, 
you know the philosophy of existentialism i wish i could read all of that here right now but i'm just going to read some of it and you know this happens much later in the book i actually expected it to start much earlier but that's just me i mean there's absolutely nothing wrong about it. anyway where is that where is that yes we used to talk about all sorts of things but especially about a subject which interested me above all others myself whenever other people made attempts to analyze me they did so from the standpoint of their own little worlds and this used to exasperate me but sartre always tried to see me as part of my own scheme of things to understand me in the light of my own set of values and attitudes then sartre held that when one has something important to tell the world it is criminal to waste one's energies on other occupations the work of art or literature was in his view an absolute end in itself and it was even though he never said so i was sure he believed this the be all and end all of the entire universe i think that's it yeah for my part i was beginning to feel that time which was not spent in his company was time wasted and you know the effect that he had um, that jean paul sartre had on simon de beauvoir was quite significant i mean because of him and how he was and how he thought about writing and just existence in general she started to view her own life opening um, up and out before her with all its problems inflexibilities struggles hard work yet you know she felt that there was so much more to be done and so much more truth to be revealed so uh, yeah let me just leave it at that this book is around 2 uh, 3 60 pages or so Uh, and believe me i wanted uh, i wanted it to be longer i mean by the end of it i was actually dreading not reading simon de beauvoir anymore but lucky for me and for all of us she has written other works as well so there is her non fiction uh outstanding non fiction the second sex and i also have her the first novel that she wrote which is she came to stay but the one that is at the top of my list is letters to sartre written by simon de beauvoir of course because the little window uh, into her and sartre's conversations and friendship that she opens for us in her memoirs you just you know after after reading that you just want to know more a lot more okay then that was my journey and my experience of reading this book memoirs of a dutiful daughter by simone de beauvoir i really hope that you read it too and you know for the simple reason uh, of getting a woman's perspective on philosophy and life and its meaning in general so yeah Thank you so much for watching if you're still here it uh, means a lot and I hope you have a great day